The Unknown Murderer by H. C. Bailey. Recording by Nan Dodge. Once upon a time, a number of men in a club discussed how Mr. Reginald Fortune came to be the expert advisor of the Home Office upon crime. The doctors admitted that though he is a competent surgeon, pathologist, and what not, he never showed international form. There was a fellow of the Royal Society who urged that Fortune knew more about natural science than most schoolboys, politicians, and civil servants. An artist said he had been told Fortune understood business, and his banker believed Fortune was a judge of old furniture. But they all agreed that he is a jolly good fellow, which means, being interpreted, he can be all things to all men. Mr. Fortune himself is convinced that he was meant by Providence to be a general practitioner, to attend to my lumbago and your daughter's measles. He has been heard to complain of the chance that has made him, knowing something of everything, nothing completely, into a specialist. His only qualification, he will tell you, is that he doesn't get muddled. There you have it, then. He is singularly sensitive to people. Very odd how he knows men, said Superintendent Bell reverently, as if he had an extra sense to tell him of people's souls, like smells or colors. And he has a clear head. He is never confused about what is important and what isn't, and he has never been known to hesitate in doing what is necessary. Consider his dealing with the affair of the unknown murderer. There was not much interesting crime that Christmas. The singular case of Sir Humphrey Bigod, who was found dead in a chalk pit on the eve of his marriage, therefore obtained a lot of space in the papers, which kept it up even after the coroner's jury had declared for death by misadventure, with irrelevant inventions and bloodthirsty hints of murder and tales of clues. This did not disturb the peace of the scientific adviser to the criminal investigation department, who knew that the lad was killed by a fall, and that there was no means of knowing any more. Mr. Fortune was much occupied in being happy, for after a long endeavor he had engaged Joan Amber to marry him. The lady has said the endeavor was hers, but I am not now telling that story. Just after Christmas she took him to the children's party at the home of help. It is an old-fashioned orphanage, a huge barrack of a building, but homely and kind. Time out of mind, people of all sorts, with old titles and new, with money and with brains, have been friends of its children. When Miss Amber brought Reggie Fortune under the flags and strings of paper roses into its hall, which was as noisy as the parrot house, he gasped slightly. Be brave, child, she said. This is quiet to what it will be after tea, and cool. You will be much hotter. You don't know how hot you'll be. Woman, you have deceived me, said Mr. Fortune bitterly. I thought philanthropists were respectable. Yes, dear, don't be frightened. You're only a philanthropist for the afternoon. I ask you, is that Crab Warnham? Of course it's Captain Warnham. Miss Amber smiled beautifully at a gaunt man with a face like an old jockey. He flushed as he leered back. Do you know his wife? She's rather precious. Poor woman. He doesn't look comfortable here, does he? The last time I saw Crab Warnham was in a place that's several kinds of hell in Berlin. He was quite at home there. Forget it, said Miss Amber gently. You will when you meet his wife and their boy's a darling. His boy, Reggie was startled. Oh, no, she was a widow. He worships her and the child. Reggie said nothing. It appeared to him that Captain Warnham, for a man who worshipped his wife, had a hungry eye on women. And the next moment Captain Warnham was called to attention. A small woman, still pretty, though earnest, talked to him like a mother or a commanding officer. He was embarrassed, and when she had done with him, he fled. The small woman, who was austerely but daintily clad in black, with some white at the neck, continued to flit amongst the company, finding everyone a job of work. She says to one, 
Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh. And who is she, Joan? Lady Chantry, said Miss Amber. She's Providence here, you know. And Lady Chantry was upon them. Reggie found himself looking down into a pair of uncommonly bright eyes, and wondering what it felt like to be as strenuous as the little woman who was congratulating him on Joan, thanking him for being there, and arranging his afternoon for him all in one breath. He had never heard anyone talk so fast. In a condition of stupor he saw Joan reft from him to tell the story of Cinderella to magic lantern pictures in one dormitory, while he was led to another to help in a scratch concert. And as the door closed on him he heard the swift, clear voice of Lady Chantry, exhorting staff and visitors, to play round games. He suffered. People who had no voices sang showy songs. People who had too much voice sang ragtime to those solemn, respectful children. In pity for the children and himself, he set up as a conjurer, and the dormitory was growing merry when a shriek cut into his patter. "'That's only my bones creaking,' he went on quickly, for the children were frightened. "'They always do that when I put the knife in at the ear and take it out of my hind leg. "'So, but it doesn't hurt. "'As the motor-car said when it ran over the policeman's feet, "'all done by kindness. "'Come here, Jenny Wren. "'You mustn't use your nose as a money-box.' "'A small person submitted to having pennies taken out of her face.' The door opened, and a pallid nurse said faintly, "'The doctor. Are you the doctor?' "'Of course,' said Reggie. "'One moment, people. Mr. Punch has fallen over the baby. It always hurts him. In the hump. Are we downhearted? No. Pack up your troubles in the old kit bag.' He went out to a joyful roar of that lyric. "'What's the trouble?' The nurse was shaking. "'In there, sir. She's up there.' Reggie went up the stairs in quick time. The door of a little sitting-room stood open. Inside it, people were staring at a woman who sat at her desk. Her dress was dark and wet. Her head lolled forward. A deep gash ran across her throat. "'Yes, there's too many of us here,' he said, and waved the spectators away. One lingered, an old woman, large and imposing, and announced that she was the matron. Reggie shut the door and came back to the body in the chair. He held the limp hands a moment. He lifted the head and looked close into the flaccid face. When was she found? When I heard that scream? Yes. He examined the floor. Quite so. He turned to the matron. Well, well, who is she? It's our resident medical officer, Dr. Emily Hall. But, Dr. Fortune, can't you do anything? "'She's gone,' said Reggie. "'But this is terrible, doctor. What does it mean?' "'Well, I don't know what it means. "'Her throat was cut by a highly efficient knife, probably from behind. "'She lingered a little while, quite helpless, and died, not so very long ago. "'Who screamed?' "'The nurse who found her. "'One of our own girls, Dr. Fortune, Edith Baker. "'She was always a favorite of poor Dr. Hall's. She has been kept on here at Dr. Hall's wish to train as a nurse. She was devoted to Dr. Hall, one of these girlish passions. And she came into the room and found this and screamed? So she tells me, said the matron. Well, well, Reggie sighed, poor kiddies. And now you must send for the police. I have given instructions, Dr. Fortune, said the matron with dignity. And I think you ought to keep Edith Baker from talking about it. Reggie opened the door. Edith will not talk, said the matron coldly. She is a very reserved creature. Poor thing, but I'm afraid some of our visitors will, and they had better not, you know. At last he got rid of the lady and turned the key in the lock and stood looking at it. Yes, quite natural, but very convenient, said he, and turned away from it and contemplated a big easy chair. The loose cushion on the seat showed that somebody had been sitting in it a fact not in itself remarkable, but there was a tiny smear of blood on the arm still wet. He picked up the cushion. On the underside was a larger smear of blood. Dr. Fortune's brow contracted. The unknown murderer cuts her throat, comes over here, 
makes a mess on the chair, turns the cushion over, and sits down to watch the woman die. This is rather diabolical. He began to wander round the room. It offered him no other signs but some drops of blood on the hearth rug and the hearth. He knelt down and peered into the fire, and with the tongs drew from it a thin piece of metal. It was a surgical knife. He looked at the dead woman. From your hospital equipment, Dr. Hall, and Edith Baker is a nurse, and Edith Baker had a girlish passion for you, I wonder. Someone was trying the door. He unlocked it to find an inspector of police. I am Reginald Fortune, he explained. Here's your case. I've heard of you, sir, said the inspector reverently. Bad business, isn't it? I'm sure it's very lucky you were here. I wonder, Reggie murmured. Could it be suicide, sir? Reggie shook his head. I wish it could. Not a nice murder. Not at all a nice murder. By the way, there's the knife. I picked it out of the fire. Doctor's tool, isn't it, sir? Have you got any theory about it? Reggie shook his head. There's the girl who gave the alarm. She's a nurse in the hospital, I'm told. I don't know the girl, said Reggie. You'd better see what you make of the room. I shall be downstairs. In the big hall, the decorations and the Christmas tree with its ungiven presence glowed to emptiness and silence. Joan Amber came forward to meet him. He did not speak to her. He continued to stare at the ungiven presence on the Christmas tree. What do you want to do, she said at last. This is the end of a perfect day, said Mr. Fortune. Poor kiddies. The matron packed them all off to their dormitories. Mr. Fortune laughed. Just as well to rub it in, isn't it? Miss Amber did not answer him for a moment. Do you know, you look rather terrible, she said. And indeed, his normally plump, fresh-colored, cheery face had a certain ferocity. I feel like a fool, Joan. Where is everybody? She sent everybody away, too. She would. Great organizer. No brain. My only aunt. A woman's murdered, and every stranger who was in the place is hustled off before the police get to work. This isn't a crime, it's a nightmare. Well, of course they were anxious to go. They would be. Reggie, who are you thinking of? I can't think. There are no facts. Where's this matron now? The inspector came upon them as they were going to her room. I finished upstairs, sir. Not much for me, is there? Plenty downstairs, though. I reckon I'll hear some queer stories before I've done. These homes are always full of gossip. People living too close together. Wonderful what bad blood it makes. I... He broke off and stared at Reggie. From the matron's room came the sound of sobbing. He opened the door without a knock. The matron sat at her writing table, coldly judicial. A girl in nurse's uniform was crying on the bosom of Lady Chantry, who caressed her and murmured in her ear. "'Sorry to interrupt, ma'am,' the inspector said, staring hard. "'You don't interrupt. This girl is Edith Baker, who seems to have been the last person who saw Dr. Hall alive, and was certainly the first person who saw her dead, and who was very, very fond of her.' "'Lady Chantry said gently, "'Weren't you, dear?' "'I'll have to take her statement,' said the inspector, "'but the girl was torn with sobbing. "'Come, dear, come,' Lady Chantry strove with her. "'The inspector only wants you to say how you left her "'and how you found her. "'Edith, you must control yourself,' the matron lifted her voice. "'I hate you,' the girl cried, "'and tore herself away and rushed out of the room.' "'She'll have to speak, you know, ma'am,' the inspector said. "'I am very sorry to say she has always had a passionate temperament,' said the matron. "'Poor child,' Lady Chantry rose. "'She was so fond of the doctor, you see. "'I'll go to her matron and see what I can do. "'Does anyone here know what the girl was up to this afternoon, ma'am?' said the inspector. "'I will try to find out for you,' said the matron, and rang her bell.' "'Well, well,' said Reggie Fortune, "'every little helps. "'You might find out what all the other people were doing this afternoon.' "'The matron stared at him. "'Surely you're not thinking of the visitors, Mr. Fortune?' "'I am thinking of your children,' said Reggie. 
and she was the more amazed. Not a nice murder, you know. Not at all a nice murder. And then he took Miss Amber home. She found him taciturn, which is his habit when he is angry, but she had never seen him angry before. She is a wise woman. When he was leaving her, Do you know what it is about you, sir? she said. You're always just right. When the Honorable Sidney Lomas came to his room in Scotland Yard the next morning, Reggie Fortune was waiting for him. My dear fellow, he protested, what is this? You're not really up, are you? It's not eleven. You're an hallucination. Zeal, all zeal, Lomas. The orphanage murder is my trouble. Have you come to give yourself up? I suspected you from the first, Fortune. Where is it? He took a copy of the Daily Wire from the rack. Yes, Dr. Reginald Fortune, the eminent surgeon, was attending the function and was able to give the police a first-hand account of the crime. Dr. Fortune states that the weapon used was a surgical knife. My dear fellow, the case looks black indeed. Reggie was not amused. Yes, I also was present, and several others, he said. Do you know anything about any of us? Lomas put up his eyeglass. There's a certain bitterness about you, Fortune. This is unusual. What's the matter? I don't like this murder, said Reggie. It spoilt the children's party. That would be a by-product, Lomas agreed. You're getting very domestic in your emotions. Oh, I like it, my dear fellow, but it makes you a little irrelevant. Domestic be damned. I'm highly relevant. It spoilt the children's party. Why did it happen at the children's party? Lots of other nice days to kill the resident medical officer. You're suggesting it was one of the visitors? No, no, it isn't the only day visitors visit. I'm suggesting life is real, life is earnest, and rather diabolical sometimes. I'll call for the reports, Lomas said, and did so. Good gad, reams! Barton's put in some heavy work. I thought he would, said Reggie, and went to read over Lomas's shoulder. At the end, Lomas lay back and looked up at him. Well, Barton's put his money on this young nurse, Edith Baker. Yes, that's the matron's tip. I saw the matron, one of the world's organizers, Lomas, a place for everything and everything in its place. And if you don't fit, God help you. Edith Baker didn't fit. Edith Baker has emotions. Therefore, she does murders, Q-E-D. Well, the matron ought to know the girl. She ought, Reggie agreed. And our case is, gentlemen, that the matron who ought to know girls says Edith Baker isn't a nice young person. Lomas, dear, why do policemen always believe what they're told? What the matron don't like isn't evidence. There is some evidence. The girl had one of these hysterical affections for the dead woman, passionately devoted and passionately jealous and so forth. The girl had access to the hospital instruments. All her time in the afternoon can't be accounted for, and she was the first to know of the murder. It's not good enough, Lomas. Why did she give the alarm? Lomas shrugged. A murderer does now and then, cunning or fright. And why did she wait for the children's party to do the murder? Something may have happened there to rouse her jealousy. Something with one of the visitors, Reggie suggested. I wonder. And then he laughed. A party of the visitors went round the hospital, Lomas. They had access to the surgical instruments. And they were suddenly seized with a desire for homicide. They also went to the gymnasium and the kitchen. Did any of them start boiling potatoes? My dear fortune, you are not as plausible as usual. It isn't plausible, Reggie said. I know that. It's too damn wicked. Abnormal, Lomas nodded. Of course, the essence of the thing is that it's abnormal. Every once in a while we have these murders in an orphanage or school or some place where women and children are herded together. Nine times out of ten they are cases of hysteria. Your young friend, Miss Baker, seems to be a highly hysterical subject. You know more than I do. Why, that's in the evidence. And you saw her yourself half crazy with emotion after the murder. Good Lord, said Reggie, Lomas, old thing, you do run on. Pantom time toils after you in vain. 
That girl wasn't crazy. She was the most natural of us all. You send a girl in her teens into the room where the woman she is keen on is sitting with her throat cut. She won't talk to you like a little lady. The evidence. Why do you believe what people tell you about people? They're always lying, by accident if not on purpose. This matron don't like the girl because she worshipped the lady doctor. Therefore, the girl is called abnormal and jealous. Did you never hear of a girl in her teens worshipping a teacher? It's common form. Did you never hear of another teacher being vicious about it? That's just as common. Do you mean the matron was jealous of them both? Reggie shrugged. It hit you in the eye. Good God, said Lomas. Do you suspect the matron? I suspect the devil, said Reggie gravely. Lomas, my child, whoever did that murder, cut the woman's throat and then sat down in her easy chair and watched her die. I call that devilish. And he told of the bloodstains and the turned cushions. Good gad, said Lomas once more. There's some hate in that. Not a nice murder. Also, it stopped the children's party. You harp on that, Lomas looked at him curiously. Are you thinking of the visitors? I wonder, Reggie murmured. I wonder. Here's the list, Lomas said, and Reggie came slowly to look. Sir George and Lady Bean, Lady Chantry, Mrs. Carraway, he ran his pencil down. All well-known, blameless busybodies full of good works. Nothing doing. Crab Warnham, said Reggie. Oh, Warnham, his wife took him, I suppose. She's a saint, and he eats out of her hand, they say. Well, he was a loose fish, of course, but murder. I don't see Warnham at that. He has his eye for a woman. Still, I dare say. But look. But good God. You can't have known this lady doctor. Was she pretty? Reggie nodded. Well, we might f look for a link between them. Not likely, is it? We're catching at straws, said Reggie somberly. Lomas pushed the papers away. Confound it, it's another case without evidence. I suppose it can't be suicide like that bigot affair. Reggie, who was lighting a cigar, looked up and let the match burn his fingers. Not suicide, no, he said. Was bigots? Well, it was a deuced queer death by misadventure. As you say, Reggie nodded and wandered dreamily out. This seems to have been the first time that anyone thought of comparing the bigot case to the orphanage murder. When the inquest on the lady doctor was held, the police had no more evidence to produce than you have heard, and the jury returned a verdict of murder by some person or persons unknown. Newspapers strove to enliven the dull calm of the holiday season by declaiming against the inefficiency of a police force which allowed murderers to remain anonymous, and hashed up the Bigod case again to prove that the fall of Sir Humphrey Bigod into his chalk pit though called accidental, was just as mysterious as the cut throat of Dr. Hall. And the Honorable Sidney Lomas cursed the man who invented printing. These assaults certainly did not disturb Reggie Fortune, who has never cared what people say of him. With the help of Joan Amber, he found a quiet, remote place for the unhappy girl suspected of the murder. Lady Chantry was prettily angry with Miss Amber about that, protesting that she wanted to look after Edith herself, and said he was only in the case as a philanthropist, after which he gave all his time to preparing his house and Miss Amber for married life. But the lady found him dreamy. It was, in fact, while he was showing her how the new colors in the drawing-room looked under the new lighting that Dr. Eden called him up. Dr. Eden has a general practice in Kensington, Dr. Eden wanted to consult him about a case, most urgent, three King William's Walk. "'May I take the car?' said Reggie to Joan. "'He sounds rattled. You can go on home afterwards. It's not far from you, either. I wonder who lives at three King William's Walk.' "'But it's Mrs. Warnham,' she cried. "'Oh, my aunt,' said Reggie Fortune, and said no more. And Joan Amber could not call him out of his thoughts.' She was as grave as he, only when he was getting out of the car 
Be good to her, dear, she said gently. He kissed the hand on his arm. The door was opened by a woman in evening dress. It is, Mr. Fortune, isn't it? Please come in. It's so kind of you to come. She turned to the maid in the background. Tell Dr. Eden, Maggie, it's my little boy, and we are so anxious. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Warnham. Reggie took her hand and found it cold. The face he remembered for its gentle calm was sternly set. What is the trouble? Gerald went to a party this afternoon. He came home gloriously happy and went to bed. He didn't go to sleep at once. He was rather excited, but he was quite well. Then he woke up crying with pain and was very sick. I sent for Dr. Eden. It isn't like Gerald to cry, Mr. Fortune, and... A hoarse voice said, "'Catherine, you oughtn't to be out there in the cold.' Reggie saw the gaunt face of Captain Warnham looking round a door at them. "'What does it matter?' she cried. "'Dr. Eden doesn't want me to be with him, Mr. Fortune. He is still in pain, and I don't think Dr. Eden knows.' Dr. Eden came down in time to hear that. A large young man, he stood over them looking very awkward and uncomfortable." "'I'm sure Dr. Eden has done everything that can be done,' said Reggie gently. "'I'll go up, please.' And they left the mother to her husband, that flushed, gaunt face peering round the corner as they kept step on the stairs. "'The child's seven years old,' said Eden. "'There's no history of any gastric trouble. Rather a good digestion. And then this, out of the blue.' Reggie went into a nursery where a small boy lay huddled, and restless with all the apparatus of sickness by his bed. He raised a pale face on which beads of sweat stood. Hello, Gerald, Reggie said quietly. Mother sent me up to make you all right again. He took the child's hand and felt for the pulse. I'm Mr. Fortune, your fortune, good fortune. The child tried to smile and Reggie's hands moved over the uneasy body and all the while he murmured softly nonsense talk. The child did not want him to go, but at last he went off with Eden into a corner of the room. Quite right to send for me, he said gravely, and Eden put his hand to his head. I know, it's horrible when it's a child. One of the irritant poisons, probably arsenic. Have you given an emetic? He's been very sick, and he's so weak. I know, have you got anything with you? I sent home, but I didn't care to. I'll do it, sulfate of zinc. You go and send for a nurse and find some safe milk. I wouldn't use the household stuff. My God, Fortune, surely it was at the party. Not the household stuff, Reggie repeated, and he went back to the child. It was many hours afterward that he came softly downstairs. In the hall, husband and wife met him. It seemed to him that it was the man who had been crying. "'Are you going away?' Mrs. Warnham said. "'There's no more pain. He is asleep.' Her eyes darkened. "'You mean he's dead?' the man gasped. "'I hope he'll live longer than any of us, Captain Warnham, but no one must disturb him. The nurse will be watching, you know, and I'm sure we all want to sleep sound, don't we?' He was gone, but he stayed a moment on the doorstep. He heard emotions within. On the next afternoon, Dr. Eden came into his laboratory at St. Saviour's. One moment, one moment. Reggie was bent over a notebook. When I go to hell, they'll set me doing sums. He frowned at his figures. The third time is lucky. That's plausible, if it isn't right. Well, how's our large patient? He's doing well, quite easy and cheerful. Reggie stood up. I think we might say, thank God. Yes, rather. I thought he was gone last night, Fortune. He would have been without you. It was wonderful how he bucked up in your hands. You ought to have been a children's specialist. My dear chap, oh, my dear chap, I'm the kind of fellow who would always ought to have been something else. And so I'm doing sums in a laboratory, which God knows I'm not fit for. Have you found out what it was? Oh, arsenic, of course. Quite a fair dose he must have had. It's queer how they always will use arsenic. Eden stared at him. What are we to do, he said in a low voice. 
fortune, I suppose it couldn't have been accidental. What is a child likely to eat in which he would find grains of accidental arsenic? Yes, but then, I mean, who could want to kill that child? That is the unknown quantity in the equation, but people do want to murder children, quite nice children. Eden grew pale. What do you mean? You know he's not Warnham's child. Warnham's his stepfather. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen the two together? Eden hesitated. He, well, he didn't seem to take to Warnham, but I'd have sworn Warnham was fond of him. And that's all quite natural, isn't it? Well, well, I hope he's in. What do you mean to do? Tell Mrs. Warnham with her husband listening. Dr. Eden followed him out like a man going to be hanged. Mrs. Warnham indeed met them in her hall. Mr. Fortune, she took his hand. She had won back her old calm, but her eyes grew dark as she looked at him. Gerald has been asking for you, and I want to speak to you. I shall be glad to talk over the case with you and Captain Warnham, said Reggie gravely. I'll see the small boy first, if you don't mind. And the small boy kept his Mr. Fortune a long time. Mrs. Warnham had her husband with her when the doctors came down. I say, Fortune, Captain Warnham started up. Awfully good of you to take so much trouble. I mean to say, he cleared his throat. I feel it, you know. How is the little beggar? There's no reason why he shouldn't do well, Reggie said slowly. But it's a strange case, Captain Warnham. Yes, a strange case. You may take it. There is no doubt the child was poisoned. Poisoned? Warnham cried out in that queer, hoarse voice. You mean it was something Gerald shouldn't have eaten? Mrs. Warnham said gently. It was arsenic, Captain Warnham. Not much more than an hour before the time he felt ill, perhaps less, he had swallowed enough arsenic to kill him. I say, are you certain of all that? I mean to say, no doubt about anything? Warnham was flushed. Arsenic, and the time, and the dose? It's pretty thick, you know. There is no doubt I have found arsenic. I can estimate the dose, and arsenic acts within that time. But I can't believe it, Mrs. Warnham said. It would be too horribly cruel. Dr. Fortune, couldn't it have been an accident, something in his food? It was certainly in his food or drink, but not accident, Mrs. Warnham. That is not possible. I say, let's have it all out, Fortune, Warnham growled. Do you suspect anyone? That's rather for you, isn't it, said Reggie. Who would want to poison Gerald? Mrs. Warnham cried. He says someone did, Warnham growled. When do you suppose he took the stuff, Fortune? At the party or after he came home? What did he have when he came home? Warnham looked at his wife. Only a little milk. He wouldn't eat anything, she said. And I tasted his milk, I remember. It was quite nice. That points to the party, Eden said. But I can't believe it. Who would want to poison Gerald? I've seen some of the people who were there, Eden frowned. I don't believe there's another child ill. Only this one of the whole party. Yes, yes, a strange case, said Reggie. Was there anyone there with a grudge against you, Mrs. Warnham? I don't think there's anyone with a grudge against me in the world. I don't believe there is, Catherine, her husband looked at her. But, damn it, Fortune found the stuff in the child. I say, Fortune, what do you advise? You're sure of your own household? There's nobody here jealous of the child? Mrs. Warnham looked her distress. I couldn't, I couldn't doubt anybody. There isn't any reason. You know, it doesn't seem real. And there it is, Warnham growled. Yes, well, I shouldn't talk about it, you know. When he's up again, take him right away, somewhere quiet. You'll live with him yourself, of course. That's all safe. And I, well, I shan't forget the case. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Fortune, she started up and caught his hands. Yes, yes, goodbye, said Reggie, and got away. But as Warnham let them out, he felt Warnham's lean hand grip into his arm. A little homely comfort would be grateful, Reggie murmured. Come and have tea at the Academy's Eden. They keep a pleasing muffin. He sank down in his car at Eden's side with a happy sigh. 
But Eden's brow was troubled. Do you think the child will be safe now, Fortune, he said? Oh, I think so. If it was Warnham or Mrs. Warnham who poisoned him. Good Lord, you don't think that. They are frightened, said Reggie placidly. I frightened him quite a lot. And if it was somebody else, the child is going away and Mrs. Warnham will be eating and drinking everything he eats and drinks. The small Gerald will be all right. There remains only the little problem. Who was it? It's a diabolical affair. Who could want to kill that child? Diabolical is the word, Reggie agreed, and a little simple food is what we need. And they went into the club, and through a long tea he talked to Eden of rock gardens and Chinese nursery rhymes. But when Eden, somewhat dazed by his appetite and the variety of his conversation, was gone, he made for that corner of the club where Lomas sat drinking tea made in the Russian manner. He pointed a finger at the clear, weak fluid. It was sad and bad and mad, and it was not even sweet, he complained. Take care, Lomas. Think what's happened to Russia. You would never be happy as a Bolshevik. I understand that the detective police force is the one institution which has survived in Russia. Put down that repulsive concoction and come and take the air. Lomas stared at him in horror. Where's your young lady? I thought you were walking out. You're a faithless fellow, Fortune. Go and walk like a little gentleman. But there was that in Reggie's eye which made him get up with a groan. You're the most ruthless man I know. The car moved away from the club and Reggie shrank under his rug as the January east wind met them. I hope you are cold, said Lomas. What is it now? It was nearly another anonymous murder and Reggie told him the story. Diabolical, said Lomas. Yes, I believe in the devil, Reggie nodded. Who stood to gain by the child's death? It's clear enough there's only Warnham. Mrs. Warnham was left a rich woman when her first husband died, old Staveley. Everyone knew that was why Warnham was after her, but the bulk of the fortune would go to the child, so he took the necessary action. Good Gad, we all know Crab Warnham didn't stick at a trifle, but this, cold-blooded scoundrel, can you make a case of it? I like you, Lomas, you're so natural, Reggie said. That's all quite clear, and it's all wrong. This case isn't natural, you see. It hath a devil. Do you mean to say it wasn't Warnham? It wasn't Warnham. I tried to frighten him. He was frightened, but not for himself because the child has an enemy, and he doesn't know who it is. Oh, my dear fellow, he's not a murderer because you like his face. Who could like his face? No. The poison was given at the party where Warnham wasn't. But why? What possible motive? Some homicidal lunatic goes to a Kensington children's party and picks out this one child to poison. Not very credible, is it? No, it's diabolical. I didn't say a lunatic. When you tell me what lunacy is, we'll discuss whether the poisoner was sane. But the diabolical is getting a little too common, Lomas. There was Bigod, young, healthy, well-off, just engaged to a jolly girl. He falls into a chalk pit, and the jury says it was misadventure. There was the lady doctor, young, clean-living, not a ghost of a past, everybody liking her. She is murdered, and a girl who was very fond of her nearly goes mad over it. Now there's the small Gerald, a dear kid. His mother worships him. His stepfather's mighty keen on him. Everybody likes him. Somebody tries to poison him and nearly brings it off. What are you arguing, Fortune? It's odd the cases should follow one another. Deuced awkward. We can't clean them up. But what then? They're not really related. The people are unconnected. There's a different method of murder, if the bigot case was murder. The only common feature is that the man who attempted murder is not known. You think so? Well, well. What I want to know is, was there anyone at Mrs. Lawley's party in Kensington who was also at the home of help party and also staying somewhere near the chalk pit 
when Bigot fell into it. Put your men on to that. Good gad, said Lomas. But the cases are not comparable, not in the same class. Different method, different kind of victim. What motive could any creature have for picking out just these three to kill? Reggie looked at him. Not nice murders, are they, he said. I could guess, and I dare say, will only guess in the end. That night he was taking Miss Amber, poor girl, to a state dinner of his relations. They had ten minutes together before the horrors of the ceremony began, and she was benign to him about the recovery of the small Gerald. It was dear of you to ring up and tell me. I love Jerry. Poor Mrs. Warnham. I just had to go round to her, and she was sweet. But she has been frightened. You're rather a wonderful person, sir. I didn't know you were a children's doctor, as well as a million other things. What was the matter? Mrs. Warnham didn't tell us. It must... Who are us, Joan? Why, Lady Chantry was with her. She didn't tell us what it really was. After we came away, Lady Chantry asked me if I knew. But I'm afraid you don't, Reggie said. Joan, I don't want you to talk about the small Jerry. Do you mind? My dear, of course not. Her eyes grew bigger. But Reggie, the boy's going to be all right. Yes, yes. You're rather a dear, you know. And at the dinner table, which then received them, his family found him of an unwanted solemnity. It was agreed, with surprise and reluctance, that engagement had improved him, that there might be some merit in Miss Amber after all. A week went by. He had been separated from Miss Amber for one long afternoon to give evidence in the case of the illegitimate Pekingese when she rang him up on the telephone. Lady Chantry, she said, had asked her to choose a day and bring Mr. Fortune to dine. Lady Chantry did so want to know him. Does she, though, said Mr. Fortune. She was so nice about it, said the telephone, and she really is a good sort, Reggie. She's always doing something kind. Joan, said Mr. Fortune, you're not to go into her house. Reggie, said the telephone. That's that, said Mr. Fortune. I'll speak to Lady Chantry. Lady Chantry was at home. She sat in her austerely pleasant drawing room, toasting a foot at the fire, a small foot which brought out a pretty leg. Of course she was in black with some white about her neck, but the loose gown had grace. She smiled at him and tossed back her hair. Not a thread of white showed in its crisp brown, and it occurred to Reggie that he had never seen a woman of her age carry off bobbed hair so well. What was her age? Her eyes were as bright as a bird's, and her clear pallor was unfurrowed. So good of you, Mr. Fortune. Miss Amber has just told me. They spoke together. She got the lead then. It was kind of her to let you know at once, but she's always kind, isn't she? I did so want you to come and make friends with me before you're married, and it will be very soon now, won't it? Oh, but do let me give you some tea. No tea, thank you. Won't you? Well, please ring the bell. I don't know how men can exist without tea, but most of them don't now, do they? You're almost unique, you know. I suppose it's the penalty of greatness. I came round to say that Miss Amber won't be able to dine with you, Lady Chantry. It was a moment before she answered. But that is too bad. She told me she was sure you could find a day. She can't come, said Reggie sharply. The man has spoken, she laughed. Oh, of course she mustn't go behind that. He was given a keen, mocking glance. And can't you come either, Mr. Fortune? I have a great deal of work, Lady Chantry. It's come rather unexpectedly. Indeed, you do look worried. I'm so sorry. I'm sure you ought to take a rest. A long rest. A servant came in. Won't you really have some tea? No, thank you. Good-bye, Lady Chantry. He went home and rang up Lomas. Lomas, like the father of baby Bunting, had gone a-hunting. Lomas was in Leicestershire. Superintendent Bell replied, Did Bell know if they had anything new about the unknown murderer? 
"'Inquiries are proceeding it, sir,' said Superintendent Bell. "'Damn it, Bell, I'm not the House of Commons. Have you got anything?' "'Not what you'd call definite, sir, no.' "'You'll say that on the Day of Judgment,' said Reggie. "'It was on the next day that he found a telegram waiting for him "'when he came home to dress for dinner. "'Gerald ill again, very anxious. "'Beg you will come, sending car to meet evening trains. "'Warnham, Fernhurst, Blackover. "'He scrambled into the last carriage of the half-past six "'as it drew out of Waterloo. "'Mrs. Warnham had faithfully obeyed his orders.' to take Gerald to a quiet place. Blackover stands an equally uncomfortable distance from two main lines, one of which throws out towards it a feeble and spasmodic branch. After two changes, Reggie arrived, cold and with a railway sandwich rattling in his emptiness on the dimly lit platform of Blackover. The porter of all work who took his ticket thought there was a car outside. In the dark station yard, Reggie found only one. Do you come from Fernhurst, he called, and the small chauffeur, who was half inside the bonnet, shut it up and touched his cap and ran round to his seat. They dashed off into the night, climbing up by narrow, winding roads through woodland. Nothing passed them. No house gave a gleam of light. The car stopped on the crest of a hill, and Reggie looked out. He could see nothing but white frost and pines. The chauffeur was getting down. "'What's the trouble?' said Reggie, with his head out of window, and slipped the catch and came out in a bundle. The chauffeur's face was the face of Lady Chantry. He saw it in the flash of a pistol overhead as he closed with her. "'I will, I will,' she muttered, and fought him fiercely. Another shot went into the pines. He wrenched her hand round. The third was fired into her face. The struggling body fell away from him, limp. He carried it into the rays of the headlights and looked close. That's that, he said with a shrug, and put it into the car. He lit a cigar and listened. There was no sound anywhere but the sough of the wind in the pines. He climbed into the chauffeur's place and drove away. At the next crossroads he took that which led north and west and so in a while came out on the Portsmouth Road. That night the frost gathered on a motor car in a lane between Hindhead and Shotter Mill. Mr. Fortune unobtrusively caught the last train from Hazelmere. When he came out from a matinee with Joan Amber next day, the newsboys were shouting, Motor Car Mystery! Mr. Fortune did not buy a paper. It was on the morning of the second day that Scotland Yard sent for him. Lomas was with Superintendent Bell. The two of them received him with solemnity and curious eyes. Mr. Fortune was not pleased. "'Dear me, Lomas, can't you keep the peace for a week at a time?' he protested. "'What is the reason for your existence?' "'I had all that for breakfast,' said Lomas. "'Don't talk like the newspapers. Be original.' Another mysterious murder, Reggie murmured, quoting headlines. Scotland Yard baffled again. Police mandarins. No, you haven't a good press, Lomas, old thing. Lomas said something about the press. Do you know who that woman chauffeur was, Fortune? That wasn't in the papers, was it? You haven't guessed? Again, Reggie Fortune was aware of the grave curiosity in their eyes. Another of our mysterious murders, he said dreamily. I wonder. Are you working out the series at last? I told you to look for someone who was always present. Lomas looked at Superintendent Bell. Lady Chantry was present at this one, Fortune, he said. Lady Chantry took out her car the day before yesterday. Yesterday morning, the car was found in a lane above Hasselmere. Lady Chantry was inside. She wore chauffeur's uniform. She was shot through the head. Well, well, said Reggie Fortune. I want you to come down and look at the body. Is the body the only evidence? We know where she bought the coat and cap. Her own coat and hat were under the front seat. She told her servant she might not be back at night. No one knows what she went out for or where she went. 
Yes, yes, when a person is shot, it's generally with a gun. Have you found it? She had an automatic pistol in her hand. Reggie Fortune rose. I had better see her, he said sadly. A wearing world, Lomas. Come on, my car's outside. Two hours later, he stood looking down at the slight body and the scorched wound in that pale face, while a police surgeon demonstrated to him how the shot was fired. The pistol was gripped with the rigor of death in the woman's right hand. The bullet that was taken from the base of the skull fitted it. The muzzle, remark the stained scorched flesh, must have been held close to her face when the shot was fired. And Reggie listened and nodded. Yes, yes, all very clear, isn't it? A straight case. He drew the sheet over the body and paid compliments to the doctor as they went out. Lomas was in a hurry to meet them. Reggie shook his head. There's nothing for me, Lomas, and nothing for you. The medical evidence is suicide. Scotland Yard is acquitted without a stain on its character. No sort of doubt, said Lomas. You can bring all the College of Surgeons to see her. You'll get nothing else. And so they climbed into the car again. Finney, thank God, said Mr. Fortune, as the little town ran by. Lomas looked at him curiously. Why did she commit suicide, Fortune, he said. There are also other little questions, Reggie murmured. Why did she murmur bigot? Why did she murder the lady doctor? Why did she try to murder the child? Lomas continued to stare at him. How do you know she did? He said in a low voice. You're making very sure. Great heavens, you might do some of the work. I know Scotland Yard isn't brilliant, but it might take pains. Who was present at all the murders? Who was the constant force? Haven't you found that out yet? She was staying near Bigod's place. She was at the orphanage. She was at the child's party. And only she was at all three. It staggered me when I got the evidence complete. But what in heaven makes you think she is the murderer? Reggie moved uneasily. There was something malign about her. Malign? but she was always doing philanthropic work. Yes, it may be a saint who does that, or the other thing. Haven't you ever noticed some of the people who are always busy about distress? They rather like watching distress. Why, yes, but murder. And what possible motive is there for killing these different people? She might have hated one or another, but not all three. Oh, there is a common factor, don't you see? Each one had somebody to feel the death like torture. The girl Bigod was engaged to, the girl who was devoted to the lady doctor, the small Gerald's mother. There was always somebody to suffer horribly, and the person to be killed was always somebody who had a young, good life to lose. Not at all nice murders, Lomas. Genus diabolical, species feminine. Say that Lady Chantry had a devilish passion for cruelty, and it ended that night in the motor car. But why commit suicide? Do you mean she was mad? I wouldn't say that. That's for the day of judgment. When is cruelty madness? I don't know. Why did she give herself away in the end? Perhaps she found she had gone a little too far. Perhaps she knew you and I had begun to look after her. She never liked me much, I fancy. She was a little odd with me. You're an uncanny fellow, Fortune. My dear chap. Oh, my dear chap, I'm wholly normal. I'm the natural man. End of The Unknown Murderer 